Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and Richard Quest, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm Dan Murphy from CNBC, based in the UAE, and I'm thrilled to be joining you at FII here in Riyadh. Welcome again to you all. And welcome to my panel, joining me on stage for another engaging conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hani Anaya, the CEO of Sanabil here in Saudi Arabia. Jennifer Johnson is president and CEO of Franklin Templeton. Ken Morales is founder, chairman of the board and directors, and CEO of Morales and Company. Ken, welcome. And Harvey Schwartz is the CEO of the Carlyle Group. The topic of our conversation is profits from turbulence. And of course, it could not come at a more important time for the global economy and for our region. The world is entering a period of significant economic transition that could have far-reaching implications for global and Gulf investors. The impact of higher for longer interest rates, surging yields, higher oil prices, and economic fragmentation all represent critical challenges for investors. And of course, the most recent conflict has reignited geopolitical worries. So let's begin our conversation on this issue. Of course, first it was Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, unfortunately, it's Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza that has reignited these tensions. So my first question to our panel is this. How do you see these new ge geoeconomic concerns impacting markets moving forward? And from a longer-term perspective, how should investors be pricing this risk? Honey, first to you. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. So I believe in the context of investing, especially in private investing, when people discuss geopolitics, they mean to say there is like an excessive turbulence or volatility in the market. Uh, and I will tie this to what we do in Sanabil. Like, we've seen time and time, I mean, in periods that have turbulence and volatility, usually these periods are followed by periods that has amazing innovation at a, a grand scale and also outperformance in the market. We've seen this in the period after the dot-com bubble. We've seen it uh, uh, after the, in the period after the global financial crisis. And I don't think any period of, like, excessive turbulence or... Uh, volatility will be any different. As a matter of fact, we are seeing new waves of innovation that I believe will change the way uh, humanity develop in a different way. Mm. Yeah. Jenny, what's your view on the geoeconomic considerations longer term from this conflict and how investors should be pricing the risk? Well, I, I think you have to look at kind of each situation and figure out what the impact is. So, um, you know, obviously Russia, Ukraine, impact on energy prices, food, investment in security, um, I, I think it probably muted some of the growth in Europe. Um, you know, obviously the, the uh, recent just tragedies around Israel and Gaza, as long as that's contained, probably less market impact. Um, and then U.S.-China, like you have, to, you have to figure out how to play the trend. So with U.S.-China, I think, and, and post-COVID, I think that you see this whole concept of kind of China plus one on supply chain um, friend shoring, so people tending to move supply chains where they're aligned with one or the other. Uh, and then, you know, I think that, the, as, you, as Hani mentioned, just one other big trend is this technological advances. And so um, that, that, what areas you focus on, um, energy transition, uh, is going to be a little bit determined about, you know, as far as the technology, about what trend you think is the most important one. So I think you play it based on where you see those. I would say it's better to swim with the current, where you think those trends are going. Hmm. Ken, you were on CNBC this morning talking about this, so you've had a warm-up to the question. What's your view? Well, look, I think what's, uh, there are some nonlinear risks that are happening right now. Uh, no, no amount of analysis can tell you uh, if, if actors take certain <clears throat> decisions. But, but I do think, and especially when you come to this region, you realize that it's optimism and energy for the future that, that makes the world go round. And, and you see it all over Saudi Arabia right now. It's interesting to me that one of the primary documents when I got involved here 10 years ago, I think it was about six years ago that the document came out, was Vision 2030. Um, it was a 10 or 12 year document. I think at the time it was out there, and I don't think you could assume that any decade wouldn't have significant issues, um, some of which we're seeing, some of which, Dan, when you were outlining them, 
almost sounded to me like the 1970s, <laughs> uh, which then led to some of the greatest boom time in the West uh, right after that, right after very high interest rates, all sorts of issues you described. But I do think that vision to look out a decade, look out 12 years, the projects that I see being put forward by the leadership here are not two-year projects, they're 10-year projects. They are moving society forward by decades. And I think that's the right way to think of investing for the time being. Mm. Harvey, what's your view? Well, I think all risks, um, you have to think about them on the paradigm of risk. And I think you have to think about the priceability of that risk versus risks that are much more difficult to price. And I think as it relates to the geopolitical risks um, and the tragedy of war, and I think it'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the, the loss of life, which is just tragic regardless of circumstances anywhere in the world. Um, I think it's a question of how priceable things are and how you make that assessment and, and what time frame. And so I think certain geopolitical risks, particularly war, again, the tragedy of war and the loss of life, I think those things are very difficult to price in the near term, um, regardless of the conflict or where it is in the world. And I think you have to incorporate that into your risk assessment. And I think um, if your appetite for risk is high, I think you can incorporate it in one way. If your appetite for risk is low, then I think being much more liquid and prepared for more uncertain outcomes, as, as Ken just said, nonlinear risks. You have to be prepared for those. I think if you look the longer horizon, and I think if you think of the big, big drivers of activity around the globe for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and you, you, they're not limited to these three, but when you think of advances in health and longevity, and when you think of the incredible transformation in technology, this next leg up in technology, and artificial intelligence, and when you think about climate and energy transition, I think those are really significant drivers of economic activity, innovation, growth. They're going to need lots of capital. They need amazing thought leaders. We'll need lots of global cooperation. And it's hard not to be here today in the kingdom, particularly this morning um, when you hear Yasser speak, uh, and not feel enthusiastic about the opportunity set. And so when I think longer term, look, I'm a, I'm a like all of us here, a big proponent and believer in humanity. I think. The long term, you can feel very optimistic about. Short run, I think, at any given time, you have to make your own risk assessment. Mm. Just on that note of optimism and to play devil's advocate, earlier today we heard from Jamie Dimon and in comments backed up by David Solomon saying that they were perhaps looking and feeling a little more cautious about the year ahead. So how do you respond to that? Are the bankers getting it right? So I think, uh, I'll give you my own perspective on it, I think this particular period, where as we come out of a period of basically yield curve manipulation, which was done, I think, for very thoughtful reasons, but now we're shifting out of that into a totally different regime, I think there's reason for caution. I don't actually hear the question as much as optimism or pessimism, because uh, I think that's more of a long-term phenomenon, now we're just wordsmithing, but I think of the year ahead will certainly present incredible alpha opportunities, but generally speaking, I think we'll have more of a headwind than a tailwind, and my own personal view is, as we adjust to this rate regime, I think there's going to be more challenges in the near term. But it doesn't mean there won't be great alpha opportunities. Mm. Ken, I see you nodding. You agree with that? Well, I, I do think banks have a very unusual uh, view of the world. Remember, most banks, no matter what you think of their balance sheet, are levered somewhere on the order of 8 to 10 to 1. And their asset base is short-term loans that have to pay you back. Um, and as we found out earlier this year, a couple of mistakes not even on credit, but on duration, um, on a 10 to 1 balance sheet can cause significant outcomes, including uh, deposit runs. So I, I do understand why uh, the banking system is becoming uh, careful, uh, especially with the speed with which their depositors can register their um, disappointment with the earnings. I think if you're, in, if you're a company that's more or less levered are unlevered, um, it's a great time to be thinking of the future and be thinking in decades and years and investing for the time. But, you know, both of those can be true at the same time, that you can be careful about what is immediate and be thinking out over the horizon. Mm. Jenny? Well, I, I think there's some fair pessimism around, um, I, I, I look at U.S. debt at $31 trillion, uh, you know, I think it's 120 plus percent of GDP, and that I think that's keeping rates up on the long end. And I think that's what Jamie Dimon meant a bit by, 
you know, it could be a little bit rough going forward. Higher rates are going to be a problem. Having said that, from an investment standpoint, you can find opportunities in those times. And, you know, I look at secondary private equity right now where you have one of the issues in 2022, it was a denominator effect. You had fixed income and equity down and people's private portfolios were hitting thresholds that they, their investment mandate didn't allow them to do. But now what's happening is they're not actually realizing the cash flows that they historically have realized. They're still getting capital calls and so therefore they have to move it off their, their balance sheet from, or their, it, it, out of their investment portfolio and selling them at discounts um, of 30 plus percent. Similar thing going on in some of the banks. You have regional banks who are selling great mortgage pools, low interest rate mortgage pools, but are, you know, have embedded losses in them that need to get them off the balance sheet so they can raise capital. So I think you can have difficult economic times and still have investment opportunities. Mm. And honey, what's the view from the Gulf? There seems to be a decoupling here globally, Gulf growth v global growth, at least last year. Yeah, so when it comes, like, uh, I'll make a statement and then I'll qualify it with an example. Like, personally speaking, and Sanabit, we are like technology optimists and innovation optimists. However, we need to be very cautious in the short term how we allocate capital and make bets. And nothing qualifies and exemplifies this than the wave of artificial intelligence and generative AI. So if you look at AI today, for example, it's revitalizing economies around the world from foundational infrastructure, all the way to innovation and fostering new companies. Uh, however, how do you invest in AI, for example? There are clear winners. There are the picks and shovels, chip manufacturers, cloud, infrastructure. Uh, and then there are customers who are accruing so, many, so much value. But how value will accrue across the AI layers? One has to be very careful how to allocate. One example is to look at the internet in the 90s, right? So the biggest winner in search engine was Google. However, there were at least, I can count in my head, seven to 10 companies that were created before Google, and people allocated capital aggressively toward them, and they all went to zero. So we know, for example, what AI will take us to in the long term. It could be, it, it could be what leads us to human singularity. However, we need to be very careful in short term how we allocate these bets. Mm. And this mind frame is what we use in Sanabin and and, and how do we allocate capital. Mm. We have a very long-term view. We have very long-term and patient capital. However, we are very careful how we allocate bets uh, in the near term after turbulences. Mm. And you are, of course, the venture arm of the PIF, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. Um, PIF has been so busy over the last two years. It's become a really strategic, sophisticated investor in a number of sectors, sports, uh, technology, even the video gaming industry and beyond. From your perspective, what guides your investment decisions? What underpins your investment thesis? And um, you spoke a bit about how you're deploying capital, but could you expand on maybe where you're deploying capital and where the opportunities are? Uh, great question. So yes, we, we can be described as the venture arm or alternative investment arm of the PIF. So we invest globally uh, where investments make sense, where financially oriented and the way we build our portfolio, yes, I said long term, but we, are, we build basically a portfolio of funds and companies, uh, and we try to build them and we work on building them in a resilient way that can sustain turbulences across cycles. Uh, Jenny, over to you. I wanted to ask you about your investment thesis recently too. Last time you and I were on stage together was in Dubai only a couple of months ago, talking about completely um, different topics. How have the last few months been for you? And as you look ahead into 2024, where are your opportunities to deploy capital and make deals? Well, I think, um, yeah, as I just said, I actually, I love secondary uh, private equity. Um, I think that, I, I do think that, that the US economy is reasonably, I, I don't think we're gonna have a, a hard landing. I think it's a, a soft landing. Uh, and so you look at private credit today at, 13, 14%, as long as you're underwriting companies who can handle that kind of debt load, um, I think that's a great place to be. Those are kind of equity returns at the, at the debt level of the capital markets. Um, you know, uh, I, I do think in some of the emerging markets, again, that China plus one story is gonna add opportunities in places like India, um, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia. So, you know, kind of following those trends 
I think that um, technology, and, and the hard thing about the technology is sometimes there's a great technology that doesn't make it investable, right? So you have to look at AI, and I think there's going to be companies that really benefit in, from AI, and that's probably a great place to invest. I think to Harvey said healthcare. You know, I mean, we're going to look 20 years from now at how we're handling medicine today, and we're going to think it was with a blunt instrument. So, you know, deploying capital in those places. And then I would just say, I do think we're in for a little bit tougher economic environment. So good cash flowing companies probably that don't have a lot of debt on them is probably going to be important now. Mm. Um, can Harvey, can you speak to that as well? We don't invest capital the way uh, Jenny does, but we do invest our human capital, which is, uh, and, and I do think, you asked me earlier today, you know, why, why do we come all the way out here? And I think it's a great time, and I'll say this, to invest in relationships and the knowledge of your clients and your customers. It's a difficult time for everybody. And I think the relationships, it's one of those assets that I think gap accounting has gotten wrong. There is no place on the balance sheet to capitalize all the time and effort we all spend getting to know each other. Why is everybody here in this room? Is probably to get to know a lot of people better, to spend the time, develop a relationship and an understanding about your goals, and to trust each other. And it's, it's disappointing that there's no place on your balance sheet to put that type of asset. But what I think, and I've learned over uh, 40 years of being in that business, it's actually the most valuable asset you can have. And, and I do think it's a great time reach to, to, to have that. People, many, many of your clients, your customers, your friends, everybody's having a tough time understanding this, what's going on. Um, and, and now's a great time to invest in that part of your business, I think. What are you looking at from a, a deal flow and investment perspective? Yeah, so at Carlisle, we have 400 billion of assets roughly split across private equity, credit, uh, secondaries business, which I'm also very bullish on. I think there's some great opportunities. I think within any of those business lines, whether it's healthcare, energy, renewables, I think you can find great alpha opportunities. Um, and I do think some of these mega trends will shape really extraordinary returns that I was talking about earlier. Like the amount of capital we discussed earlier that has to go into energy transition. There will be massive winners in that, and there will be some losers, just like the, the Google example, because there's going to be so much capital there with such a great need. But, but those that are most effective at that and have the right skill set can deploy that capital thoughtfully. They're going to get truly excess returns. Um, you know, I think in terms of the next year, some of these flows that Jenny was talking about, you know, the increased regulation around banks and the asset dispositions that come out of there, I think, I think you'll see some great opportunities because when liquidity is dear, you want to be a liquidity provider. Yeah. And we're coming out of an excess liquidity environment. It's really a question, you know, when I say cautious before, cautious doesn't mean you don't do anything. Cautious just means you're quite thoughtful about how you're deploying that marginal bit of capital, but I think you'll see really good opportunities. Mm. Okay, very interesting. And I think that really sets the stage for the next part of our conversation. I wanted to do a rapid fire round if we can. Um, I thought that was really my job. Was just that was, I, mean, I, I think you've done well. No, no, I, that's done well. I, didn't, I didn't even know I was scripted for that, but I'm glad I fulfilled that for you. <laughs> um, I thought we could do a rapid fire round. I have a couple of sectors, industries, uh, markets to ask about. So um, I think we've already covered a lot of them, but let's unpack a few now. The first is on AI, and I love the conversation that we've all been having about this. It seems to be a central theme. Um, obviously, Yasser al Ramayan also spoke about this <laughs> earlier on today. But will AI be as disruptive as some of the futurists suggest? And if so, how? Hani, first to you. Yes, it will be definitely disruptive in a way that's unprecedented. I don't believe anyone can tell you the how. Uh, like you can see a different scenarios, how it will happen, when it will happen, but I don't think anyone can give you a definitive answer. Jenny. I agree with that point. Anytime you roll out a new technology that's really disruptive, the first thing that people do is they make more efficient whatever they do today. So you're going to see more efficiency in operations and um, you know, personalization around understanding your clients from an investment standpoint, ability to analyze more information. The interesting start, part of that is always phase two, where people then start to innovate new things. And we just can't see that yet. Mm. Ken. Yeah, I you know, don't have much more to add other than to... If you could try to think back to those in the room who actually did work before the internet, <laughs> I think today you, can't, you couldn't imagine um, 
You know, I think I used a slide rule. I told somebody I actually had to use a slide rule to do calculations when I first came out of high school, um, which I'm not even sure anybody knows what it is anymore. But uh, yeah, so I think AI will disrupt, but I think it'll be extremely positive. And uh, will, you know, like most things and technology improvements will benefit most people's lives tremendously. Hmm. Harvey, bully, bullish, bearish, gloss off full, gloss so, off uh, Pretty excited and obsessed about it. Uh, I think obsessed. it's incredible. Yeah, I think it's incredible. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on it. Um, incredibly early days. I think from, again, from a Carlisle perspective, our, you know, we have a million employees spread across our portfolio of companies all around the world. I think there's three ways you can look at it. One, you can look at it through how do we help our portfolio companies be most competitive and then develop, drive as much cash flow so we can do the best for our investors. Second way is how do we actually make investment selection and how do we use the tools for that? And third, how can we, you know, me and my team, how can we just run Carlisle better? On the first two, I can tell you that we're already deploying technology and working with our portfolio companies to drive efficiencies make them better uh, at providing value to their customers. And we have very, very, very definitive use cases on that. Um, in terms of investment decisions and looking forward, you know, we've all heard things like, oh, you can write an investment committee memo. Maybe I'm old fashioned. I don't actually think young people, I don't think they should do it that way. I don't think eighth graders uh, or people in university, I think they should write their own essays. I think it's good for our people to write their own investment committee memos. But I think as you look at portfolio construction and you think of factors that make for a thoughtful investment, I think the extent to which we can keep building these tools, super powerful. And a lot of it's about how much data you have. And so we have 35 years of proprietary data on companies, on investment decisions, and so that's valuable. And then running the company as a CEO, uh, there's a lot of hype. And so as a CEO, I'll just tell you, uh, I get very obsessed about use cases because I think everyone in my firm would want to have their own personal data scientist. That's not possible. And so when we see an opportunity, what I really want to understand is, what's the use case? What are the KPIs? How do we actually know that we're getting the proper deployment of resources and the right return on those resources? But that's uh, the speed version of how I think about it. Okay, yeah. fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, like go jump in, sure. Yeah, I would like to add to this. So I, I think humans are really great at predicting how can technology affect life in a very long term. I mean, AKA Hollywood, sci-fi Hollywood is amazing. They can tell you all the, like since the 50s, and you can see all the trends that are already happening now. But we are really bad at predicting what's going to happen in the short term. So if you look at recent history, seven years ago, when, whenever you discuss AI and Silicon Valley or the US, everyone will discuss one thing, driverless cars, and how Uber will going to be a driverless car in like three years. That was the discussion and the narrative in 2015, 16. You go back in history in 1920s, 10s, and you read publications, what, was, what, what were human imagining would happen in the 21st century? It was flying cars everywhere. And this never happened, and I don't think it will happen in the near future. So we're really good at predicting effects of tech long term, but short term and the how, I think, we're really bad at it. Mm. Hmm. Hence, we need to build portfolios in a very resilient way. So we, we focus more on building portfolios versus picking certain companies. Mm. All right, fascinating. Second rapid fire question with about six minutes to go. Mina and golf economies, what's the biggest risk in the year ahead? Honey, did you want to start with that? Uh, I'll wait for them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go, let's go back over to- Start with uh, Harvey. Yeah, let's go back over to this We're side, Harvey. We're rapid what's fire. <laughs> so uh, so I, think, uh, I think the greatest risk, obviously, would have to be geopolitical instability as we sit here today. Uh, hopefully, again, leaders will come together and we'll have, we'll have that behind us and that tragic loss of life behind us. I think when you think longer term, I think the growth opportunities are extraordinary, but obviously as the transition happens from an oil-based economy away from that, you'd always have to think of the oil risk as being front and center. But when you, again, I was here for the first uh, FII in 2017, and coming back here now, several years later, like the transformation is remarkable and the progress is remarkable. And I think it's, when you have that kind of momentum, um, it's hard to disrupt that kind of momentum once it really gets going, and so I'm super hopeful it just continues. Mm. Ken. And I'm optimistic. How's that? I like that. Yeah. yeah look, I'm very optimistic, and I think the, probably the biggest risk, I think, is a, a, a mistake along the way. Look, every, everybody makes mistakes. I look back, you know, the United States was a great economy, and we did have the 29, the 30s recession. We, we had the 70s. We've had several periods where you a lot of the population wanted to write, write off the economy and how bad it was. So I actually think 
one of the problems is the, the rapid success is, is what happens if there ever is a stumble, which always happens in business, and not disrupting the optimism and the energy that has, has gotten you to the place and not losing faith in the ability of great leaders and the uh, business leaders you're developing here to continue to make those decisions. And I think you can, I think that's one of the things that can get in the way, is just getting over that first stumble because it's human, it happens. Mm. I, I, geopolitical obviously is the big risk and the opportunity, I mean, I, I think that 90% um, you know, of the world's GDP has said they want to be carbon neutral by 2050, I think it is. Well, that's going to take a huge amount of investment and a lot of innovation that happens. And one thing about this region is it thinks in generations. Too often, governments think very short term. When you think generations and you're motivated to say, you know, oil's going to run out in three or four generations, we need to diversify our economy, and then you have very clear visions and goals around that and start to execute, that, that makes you really optimistic because you, and, and you know, for anybody who's spending a little bit of time here, seeing how quickly the change is happening, you realize actually, not only are they good at kind of planning on coming up with a plan, but actually execution. So I, I always say to people, I think your greatest breakthroughs in innovation on renewable energy is actually gonna come out of the Middle East. Very interesting, yeah. Honey? Just reflecting quickly on the history of the modern Middle East, I would definitely say geopolitical risks, but especially the risks that are based on unresolved conflicts in the region. Uh, however, I'm very optimistic, given the very strong political will we enjoy here in Saudi Arabia, mm. that we're interested not only in fostering peace and stability in Saudi, but in the region as a whole. Mm. Absolutely fascinating conversation, and we are rapidly running out of time, so unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there, but please, ladies and gentlemen, thank my panel for this fantastic contribution. Thank you again. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much.